Good morning, Good morning branches. branches. Good morning, another beautiful morning. Good morning, yes. This Amen. is Wednesday morning. Your husband. This, this is, is your my husband. <laughs> Wednesday morning. Welcome to another uh, no. what, Thursday morning. This is Thursday. Thursday. Well, see, yes. see, there you go. See, time is just going crazy, Branches, as you all know. Praise the Lord. No, 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 that was my mistake. You okay. were wrong. No. My mistake. I was wrong. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Good morning. Y'all got your Bibles and your coffee and all ready to go. Father, we come into your presence, Lord, to give you honor, glory, and praise. Lord, we come to worship and lift up your name today. In yes, this Lord. new day, Lord, we're grateful. Thank you. Grateful for your grace. Grateful for the blood of Christ that makes it possible for us to gather together, Lord, in freedom and truth. Lord, we love you. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for these, these revelations that you're giving us, these teachings, Lord, on fasting and in your word, Lord. And Lord, help us to understand it and to just give you honor and glory, Lord, in it all. Because you're worthy, Lord. Amen. Amen. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain blue. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. to fear now for I am safe with you so when I fight I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God the battle belongs to you every fear I lay at your feet I see through the night the battle belongs to you And if you are for me Who can be against me? Hallelujah, branches For Jesus there's nothing impossible for you Shine in the 
shadow You win every battle Nothing can stand against The power of a God So when I fight I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, that all belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you When I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet and I'll sing through the night Oh God, that all belongs to you Oh, that all belongs to the Lord The battle belongs to the Lord
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You are the one, Lord, that fights our battles, Lord. In Jesus' name. All glory to your name. Hallelujah, Lord. Blessed be the Lamb. Amen. We're back. Praise God. We are back. Hallelujah. Back to the fasting. Amen. The fasting teaching. Um, it's, I should find it's some good dramatic stuff. music. Good stuff. stuff that the Lord is showing praise God and I, I was reading into Daniel and Paul's encounter with fasting and uh, so many men of God fasted in the Bible so far we talked about Jesus and uh, Ezra and the Joel you know Joel 2 call to repentance and fasting and sackcloth and ashes and today, we're going to be reading in Acts 9, 8 to 12. Most people who are only partially committed from the beginning of their walk. Okay, we'll say you just get saved. and uh, you, But you're kind. Of, it's one of those salvations where you come, they call you to the altar after a, a moving message. And, you know, or some uh, celebrity's testimony. So they come to the front. They're invited for the invitation, right? And they all come to the front. And they give their hearts to the Lord. And glory to God for that. But they're only half committed. They're partially committed from the beginning of their walk with the Lord. And they tend to continue that way the whole time. Sometimes you wonder if a lot some of, of these celebrities, whether it's a career move or not. And most of those who, who, who make a lot of progress start their lives fully consecrated to the Lord Jesus Amen. to the point that they they know him they know themselves and they continue to consecrate every new area that comes up along the next day the next day it's like a continual walk they're not half in half out you know and they go to church Sunday morning and and whatever and and the rest of the week they're kind of just you know nominal but don't you stop by without holding things from the Lord. What the? <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop by, Branches. <laughs> no. we, well, actually, you could today because Ann built, made, made a bunch of cookies Speech today. to so, text. <laughs> so Speech. please do stop by. But in this case, when you're fa if you're fasting, don't stop by because she made these cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the ones that are truly mature the ones who stop by no the ones who give yeah. everything, everything everything to the lord Amen. they're fully committed right from the beginning they're total lovers of the lord of glory amen which leads me to paul the apostle and i, I was reading his story and it's like lord you knocked him off his high horse and maybe right, that's where that saying came from and right from that point on you know, he began to fast. Paul was sold out to the Lord. It didn't happen long after he came to the Lord. It happened right there on the spot from the beginning of his walk. He was totally sold out before. He was more than 72 hours in the Lord. He had completed a 72-hour fast. He, and he seen a vision and spent a long time in prayer. Acts 9, this is where we will, we will begin. Saul, being Paul, rose mm. from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So mm. they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. 
And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. Hallelujah. He has been has seen in a vision a man okay. named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain mm. his sight. So, Saul of Tarsus was later on um, named Paul. He started fasting the very minute that he met the Lord. He didn't wait. The first fast was for three days, and it was an absolute fast. He didn't drink, he didn't eat. He was so overwhelmed with his encounter with the Lord, Jesus. He didn't even want to drink or eat. He had such a burning passion in his heart for Jesus, and that passion led him to seek the Lord with fasting. And as he saw the Lord, the Lord gave him a vision, and within three days, he had seen two visions, one of the Lord Jesus and the other one of the Lord's servant who was being sent to minister to him. The word of the Lord is so true. Proverbs eight seventeen. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. And it's interesting to see what the first comments that the Lord made to Saul. He describes him as praying. We can say that the priorities of Paul's life are, are fasting and prayer. And we can know for certain that these two things were definitely a priority in his early Christian life. And it continued all the way through later on. He wants, you know, to say that his supreme ambition is I want to know Christ. You know what? I think if as young believers just coming into the kingdom, if we start teaching and discipling on fasting right from the beginning, you know, and, and disciple them on these, these uh, truths, I think a lot of these young believers would stick with it more. You know, they wouldn't be falling through the cracks. They would learn the weapon of their warfare. Is, one of the weapons is fasting. So Philippians uh, 3, 10 to 11. I think we'll start in at 8 because okay. 10 is kind of in the middle of a sentence. Mm -hmm. You're all familiar with this wonderful passage of Scripture. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ mm -hmm. Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on mm. faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, yes, becoming yes. like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I found it interesting that he didn't, he didn't necessarily say his priority was to preach the gospel. I mean, even though he did preach the gospel, his priority was what? To know the Lord Jesus. And one of the main ways to do this is by fasting. And the other way is by prayer. I mean, did he continue to fast or did he, he give up as he began to be occupied, you know, with preaching the gospel and his calling? Did he continue to seek God? as a matter of priority. Yes, I can absolutely say he did. He, uh, you know, allows us to have only a glimpse of his fasting life. He didn't talk a lot about his fastings, but he just gave us a little glimpse. He was one of the leaders of the church in Antioch who, who was fasting and ministering to the Lord and who continued fasting after the Lord had spoken to them. You know, all all the churches in Antioch fasted. And and when he wrote about his ministry, he said in 2 Corinthians 6, 3 to 8. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as mm. servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions and hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, mm. labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, and kindness, the Holy Spirit 
genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God mm. with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left through honor and dishonor through slander and praise we are treated as impostors and yet are true so one of the weapons that Paul and those that were with them used to uh, not put an obstacle in anyone's way was fasting and one of the things they did to make sure that no fault would be found in their ministry was fasting also, they labored as servants of God to commend themselves by fasting. So it's obvious that those who want to put no obstacle whatsoever in anyone's way must include fasting in their spiritual lives, in our spiritual lives. And I believe that, that you, don't, you don't want to put an obstacle whatsoever in anyone's way. And I wonder, could it be that that is the one thing that the church is lacking. Most of all, the one thing that hasn't been done. I, I believe it's obvious that those who do not want any fault to be found in their ministry can't afford to leave out fasting. The Apostle Paul and those with him found it indispensable It's like one of the necessary ingredients for their growth and, and health, actually. What if vitamins represented fasting, you know, with a person? And we didn't take in vitamins. We didn't take in enough carbohydrates, proteins, all these things. What do you think? Fats. What do you think? Well, you end up skinny like me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's metabolism. Yeah. You know, what if vitamins represented fasting with a person? And, and whatever else we put in our bodies, we're going to be found lacking if we're not in fasting. Because it's like a nutritional uh, vitamin. It's also certain that we want to commend ourselves in every way. Fasting is one of the ways. And if we don't fast, but we carry out all the other things, you know, that, that have to do with true holiness, we will be recommending ourselves in some way. We're, we're, we're recommending ourselves, but not in other ways. Do you understand that? If all the doors and windows in a house are unlocked, but there's, because we're negligent, one door is forgotten and a thief gets in and he finds he finds it and he, he he comes in the house what use is having everything else locked up mm -hmm. right so it that's or at the old adage of closing the barn door after the horses escape yeah so that's what uh, what i look at as uh fasting is like it has you know it's not been our diet and we need to repent of the love of food. There's, there's a lot of gluttony in the body of Christ today, our love for food. Well, the Catholic Church would tell you that, the, what, the gluttony being one of the seven deadly sins. And we have to do something about it. And I noticed that when people... Um, uh, well, let's just read Second Corinthians eleven twenty three to 27. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. Mm. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless mm -hmm. beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Yeah. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Wow. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day, and I was adrift at sea. <laughs> and we only on heard frequent of journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, hmm. danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil hmm. and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Dangers from false brothers. Hmm. And we only heard of the one shipwreck. He was shipwrecked two other times. You know, the, 
Uh, Paul distinguished the times when he would have loved to eat and drink, but food was not available. From the time when he deliberately gave up food, you know, that so that he can fast. He obviously fasted often. He said in fastings often here. And when Paul, Paul talked about fastings, he suggested that he did different types of, you know, fasts. And I believe uh, someone certainly absolutely fasted, Paul. <laughs> oh, Whatever my notes. That is. Sorry, my notes. Whatever like, that is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like the one he did during the three days in, in the Lord. I mean, others, others might have been complete, complete fasts with only water. And others might have been partial um, fasts, but he practiced all of them. Good example, he Paul. He practiced fasting. Yeah. Paul walked very close to the Lord. He had a lot of revelations because he fasted frequently. Now, do you see that there is there's a great relationship between how much fasting a man does, you know, out of the depth of his relationship with the Lord? as well as the effectiveness of his ministry. We don't want to settle for anything less than the best. All the great ancient people in the Old Testament, Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, all of them fasted for at least 40 days long. And the greatest of these was the Lord Jesus that we covered earlier, had a 40-day fast. So doesn't it always uh, also strike you that the man who wrote nearly half of the New Testament fasted a lot as well? Well, we do. reap what we sow. We do, but you also have to remember that Paul, like the disciples, like Jesus himself, came out of Judaism, mm -hmm. and we know that fasting was an integral part of Judaism. Mm -hmm. That is why Jesus dealt with the subject. Yes. Um, and he used the Pharisees as a good example. Obviously, the Pharisees, this was an important part of, of their Hallelujah. liturgy, important part of their worship. And and it's the public fasting, which yes. Jesus was coming against. Definitely, that they yep. come out making, you know, making it look like you're hungry and, you know, uh -huh. all that, you know, so that you get you get the blessings from men rather than the blessings of yep. God. Paul was a Pharisee. He studied yep. under Gamaliel before Long before the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus, he was fasting. Now, he was fasting ritually, mm -hmm. as Jews did in that time. He was fasting like a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. I would suggest to you that after his encounter with the Lord on the road to Damascus, his whole idea, which is what Anne's talking about right now, his whole idea, his whole concept of fasting, the whole raison d'etre, if you will, the reason for doing this change, he understood it more clearly oh, than yes. any other mm -hmm. maybe Jew of his time. And he followed Jesus' example. Hallelujah. He's no greater than his master, right. right? No greater. The question may come to some of our minds here today as to why the apostle uh, Paul never wrote, you know, exhorting other believers to fast. And there are a number of reasons for this. First, first of all, he actually did did write to believers about it. it indirectly he frequently asked believers to be imitators of him you know do follow me as i follow christ he says even as he was an imitator of christ he says you do what i do and if i'm doing what christ did then do that his life you know that was lived before them included frequent fasting so they saw this they saw the message being lived out, it was communicated to them by his life. And if that uh, is not more potent than writing something up and them reading it, you know. And secondly, most of Paul's letters were written to instruct um, the believers on what they did not know. They obviously knew from Paul's life. You know, and his companions and from the teachings that he gave them right on the spot about fasting. 
you know, so there was no need to write on the subject. This is, that's what I believe. And Paul's letters were also to answer questions that were raised or, or they were sent for correction, a lot of times for correction. <laughs> for the practices of the early church. Oh, yeah. Early believers. Yeah. Because it would seem that, that there was no need um, to write about fasting so that the matter was never raised up. So personally, I think that the believers who were serious in the New Testament times were fasters. Uh, just as they, they prayed constantly, they were fasting constantly as Paul was, as they seen him. And it's for us too. We have to imitate the Apostle Paul in his fasting life, you know, as well. And everyone else who, who fasted, we can't use ignorance. The time of ignorance is over. We have the scriptures in front of us. So another part of fasting that I want to touch upon is going into battle. How many of you know when you're going into battle, you need a plan, you need directions. You need to know what's your enemy up to and how you need direction, you need advice. And a good example of this that I was reading was found in 2 Chronicles 21 to 24. I don't think it's necessary to read all of that. Is well, it? read whatever you feel. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to, just to set this up for you, the reason why there was a fast. Um, we're well, just mm. going to read the first three verses. Because be I think that's all you need. It. Yeah. Yes, she'll, Anne will be talking through it. Mm -hmm. but. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with, with uh, them some of the Mennonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. And, and some men, sorry? And they were not Mennonites, okay? Yeah. Mennonites. <laughs> Meunites, Meunites, Meunites. Anyway, some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude mm. is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and beyond they are in Hazon Tamar, Hazazon Tamar, which is En Gedi. Then Jeho Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set mm. his face to seek the Lord yes. and proclaimed a fast throughout all all Judah and I think that's all you really need to know about what mm. this setting this up as to what this is all about so the king here Jehoshaphat learned that all these ites the Moabites Amorites uh, Menuites or whatever and all those ites were coming against him in battle and it was a great multitude and he was afraid that's a natural reaction, right? He was afraid. But what did he do? He went in to seek the Lord and to proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. It wasn't just uh, him and a few. It was for all of Judah. This was a real crisis. And they all participated. Yes. Verse 4, And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. He did what Ezra did. He turned to the Lord, and he didn't turn to man. He proclaimed a fast, but he didn't fast long. He didn't have a, it wasn't just a, a long fast. He proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah and the people fasted, seeking the Lord together. And because they were fasting, they could see things a lot clearer. How many of you know that is so true? When you get past your first day, second day, third day, and all you know, your stomach aches and all that stuff. And just your mind just seems to clear. And you, you can press in more fervently. Well, the prayer exalted the Lord and reminded the Lord of what? His promises. A lot of the, the prayers in, in the Old Testament, they came before the Lord. And they always reminded the Lord of his promises but Lord you did this and you did this and you did this they they reminded him of his character and so Jehoshaphat cr cried out 
O Lord our God, will you not execute judgment upon them? He was petitioning. He was supplicating. And it's easy to petition and to supplicate when the stomach is empty, you know, through fasting, and you pray more fervently. So as he prayed, he confessed. We're powerless. So there was a confession there. We're powerless against this great multitude that's coming up against us. We, we don't know what to do, Lord. But, Lord, irregardless of that, we're going to keep our eyes on you. First of all, he was honest, right? He was honest, and he confessed, and he said he was afraid, and he didn't know what to do. The fact that they weren't equal to this great army and the power, you know, the power of the flesh that, you know, has confidence in itself mm -hmm. is broken by fasting that total confidence when a person has made a lot of progress in fasting they know there's an increase in deliverance coming from the confidence of the flesh if there is a constant manifestation of pride then i think you need to continue fasting <laughs> or get into fasting Je jehoshaphat not only saw the enemy Clearly, he confessed the fact that they, he didn't know what to do. They were too much for them, for Judah. Too many of us seem to know exactly what to do in every circumstance. We always have an answer. It's like our kid, teenagers, right? Growing up, they always seem to have an answer. Mom and dad don't know nothing. <coughs> I know I had all the answers when I was oh, a teenager. Oh, yeah, me too. Me too. I do remember that, too. Yeah, yeah. A every circumstance, which tells me that we think we're in full control, yet it's not because of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit through us, but because of our own carnal minds, our own wills, our own emotions. And people like that can't say, you know, we do not, we don't, we don't know what, what to do because of their pride, because they always have an answer. But it's a wonderful thing when a person gets to the point where he can confess, you know what, Lord, I'm lacking in knowledge here. I have no clue what to do. You need to come in my situation and, and show me. Have you ever been there? Have you ever? I know I've been there so many times. Have you ever been in a situation that all you can do is say, Lord, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know. Jehoshaphat also confessed our eyes are on you lord <coughs> he's seen how small he was and how big god was amen he's well aware of his lack of knowledge in what to do but he didn't give up those who fast a lot don't give up they have been stripped of any confidence of the flesh They've also learned where to look. Remember, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 14. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Yeah. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that mm. the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to mm. death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Yeah. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same Praise spirit God. of faith according to what has been written, I believe and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us Hallelujah. also with Jesus and bring us Praise with God. you into his presence. Hallelujah. So we need to learn to look to Jesus and keep our eyes on him. Turn from everything else and invest everything in him. 
I mean, are there other things, other people, um, material things that we put our faith in more than Jesus? Have we come to the realization of the fact that the arm of flesh is going to fail us? Mm -hmm. If we haven't, then we're not making much progress in fasting. These are the fundamental lessons that are part of the discipline of fasting. God finds it difficult to turn a deaf ear to a fasting believer. <laughs> you know, someone who's coming to him in truth and honestly, you know, seeking him, not with any preconceived motives or just laying everything bare because they need the Lord and nothing else at that time is going to do. So as the king and the people pray, the Lord spoke to them by prophecy. So a word of the Lord came out. When all their hearts were united and they were all doing the same thing and believing for the same thing, seeking the Lord, they put aside everything else. All their hearts together, the Lord spoke a prophecy to them. See, when we're listening for his voice, he will always speak when he knows he has our full attention. And he speaks more to those, I believe, he speaks more to those who are fasting more often. Well, because I see, I think that the Lord sees that we are afflicting our flesh for mm -hmm. the sake of the ascendancy of the Spirit, of God's Spirit in us, yeah. in our lives. And he sees that we're, we want to hear. Our hearts are open to receive instruction. We're not prideful and off running our own way, doing our own thing, right? One of the reasons, you know, also is uh, most likely the fact that fasting enhances um, our capacity to listen more. And, and it helps us to hear more clearly. During a fast, many desires of the flesh are being put aside completely and the spirit is taking dominion over the soul and the body in a way that is so much greater than when we're stuffing our face, having those three meals a day and snacks in between, eating after dinner in the middle of the night like I do, eat in the middle of the night, you know. So because God communicates with men through men's spirit, it's a spiritual thing during fasting. Man hears what God is saying more clearly from God, who is spirit, to our spirit. So God spoke to the king here, asking him, you know, do not fear. Right, he told the king that the battle was his, not the king's. So as we're fasting, we're going to be attacked. Believe me, there's going to be attacks from the enemy. He hates it when we're fasting. He tried to get Jesus to abort his mission on fasting. You know. if, if you are the son of God, make this stone mm. a loaf of bread. It is written, man shall not, shall not live, live by, by bread, bread alone, alone, but by every word that proceeds, proceeds from out the, of mouth the mouth of, of God. God. So that old enemy, our adversary, he's on the left and he's on the right and he's coming from all sides. But the Lord is saying to us today, branches, just like he said to Jehoshaphat, fear not, be not dismayed at this great multitude. 
for the battle is not yours, but God's. And that's why I chose that song this morning. The battle belongs to the Lord. Lord. The Lord's going to fight for us. We just need to to look up and say, Lord, you know, I, I may be worn down, but with fasting, my tired, my body is tired. I feel weak. My knees are buckling. You know, my stomach's crying out at me. But, but take my side, Father. Father, take my side. Fight for me. Fight for me, Lord. I need you. This is why fasting is so important. In fact, it is very important for warfare. In fact, it's probably the most uh, important reason for fasting is for warfare. But that isn't all. We must... We must still stand and face the enemy. It's the, the, yes, the Lord's going to fight our battles, but what is he saying in Galatians? You know, stand and stay standing when we're facing the enemy. We don't turn around and run. Amen. Yeah, we don't. However, we face the enemy in the assurance that the battle is not ours, but the Lord's. Many believers make the mistake of thinking that when they fasted and the battle has ended... You know, that it's over with. And that is not true. The Lord told the king, okay, go out tomorrow and go out against them. See, he he still had to go out against them. And you're going to see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not. Be not dismayed. Go. Go out against them. And the Lord's going to be with you. So, though the victory was guaranteed, the enemy had to be faced, you know, that way. And the way that they were coming had to be taken. That pathway, that position had to be taken. They were to stand still, not to fight, but to see the victory of the Lord on their behalf. And it's very important, Branches, that when we're fasting to do the same, when the fast is over, we go down against the enemy. We go down in the direction that the enemy is coming from. And we may need to wait longer on the Lord, longer to know the direction. See, God told them the direction where they were coming. And when this is done, the exact location of the enemy will be revealed and what his tactics are and who, what enemy is coming. We're not to fight for victory, but from the position of victory of the cross, right? Because remember, the, the, the battle has already been won for us. We just take up a position and we stand still. We see the victory of the Lord on our behalf. And it must always be the Lord's victory since the battle is always his. But it's his victory. It's not his victory on his behalf. It's his victory on our on behalf. On behalf of his people. Yes. So we have to realize that the end of the fast may not mean it's the end of the battle. It's a major step of... It, it has great consequences, however. You know, if we are not 
if we don't keep standing. We have to keep standing until the enemy is destroyed. Ephesians 6, 11 to 17 talks about the armor of God. And many times, many times it's, it's mentioned stand, stand, stand. They worshiped, they praised, they stood, you know, they believed the Lord and they went out in battle with praising and worshiping and music and 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 you know but I, since you wanted me earlier to they read bowed Ephesians 6, before god you all know Ephesians 6 yeah i have no doubt yes they went singing and praising but i have no doubt that they went out for battle they were dressed in armor mm. they had weapons they were ready mhm they were ready Ephesians but god 6 said he will fight exactly. for them but god would god yes. would be the battle it's not the so, individual soldier that wins the right, battle it's right. god it's the general Hallelujah. you don't want me to read Ephesians 6 Okay, no. you guys all know about the other yeah. God. So the Christian soldier stands before and he fasts and he stands during the fast and he stands after the fast. We have to refuse to rest even after the battle has begun to be won. We stand until ultimately there's total, total victory. The, uh, the victory yeah. is won. That has to be our attitude. Total, total annihilation, right? The conditions that led Jehoshaphat to fast to seek the Lord are still with us today, and even in greater measure. More than ever before, the enemy is ta attacking the church. He's attacking us as individuals. He's attacking us as a whole, as, you know, the body of Christ. And it seems as if billions and billions of demons have been loosed. In fact, many years ago, um, as I was sleeping and I woke up, I heard very clearly from the Lord. And that's the time we were at Pastor Tom's church and we were fasting a lot. I heard the Lord say, the enemy has just released hordes of demons on the earth. And it was like the Lord was was warning me and preparing me you know and and, and it, it that's what he's doing right now he's coming down with great wrath because the time is short for him and he knows many demons have been loosed by satan to infiltrate the church and to wreak havoc in homes in our cities in everywhere and there's only i believe there's only a remnant a true remnant today that's genuinely in in the truth that genuinely love the Lord there's n there's not very many because narrow is the way right and few there are that find it this is a very hostile world that we're living in right now they didn't have computers and stuff back then they didn't have all this this kind of um, uh, means to be able to to uh, spread the filth around quickly around the world It's a hostile world, and they're hostile towards Jesus. That Antichrist spirit is everywhere. It, it's been there since Christ came, and now it is infiltrated everything, even the church. John says that in one of his letters. Yeah. Yeah, I've told you and it, that the uh, spirit of Antichrist is coming and indeed is, in, yeah. he is here now. I mean, now, while we're dreaming of heaven and dreaming about, you know, going to heaven and having our cake and eat it too. <laughs> Meanwhile, too many Christians are infatuated with the world, with the sin of the world. You know, and uh, the lives of those who profess to be believers, you know, are, are infatuated with the still one foot in the world, one foot in the church. And it's it, the whole establishment of the church is being... Um, the Satan's coming in and having a heyday against it. Are, are you disturbed by this? I know I'm disturbed by this. I know D is disturbed <laughs> by this. Very disturbed by this. It, it, it's troubling. It, it'll make you get on your face and fast.
and pray and seek the Lord. Father, give us strategies. Lord, let us know what's what's the spirit, prevailing spirits operating over our nations, in our families, our in our Amen. cities, over, you know, in our in the church. What is that prevailing spirit? I say it's Jezebel and and Yeah. Are there any who are moved by the holy love for the kingdom of the Lord who are moved because society's eroding, families are eroding, because the love of God is waning and the fear of God is disappearing? Are we moved by the increasing number of people who have never even heard the name of Jesus? You know, as a savior, as a loving, forgiving God savior. We, I mean, right now they're trying to pass a bill to allow Satanists to be able to teach in the schools. Yeah. They've taken out and they have, they're removing the creationist teaching. They're put, they've already put in Darwin and all this stuff and we came from goo and, and now the Satanists are trying to get in. Uh, Islam is trying to get in and teach the Quran. We need to fast and seek the Lord and cry out to him and keep on fasting and praying until these chains break and the rains of heaven open up and come down. There's an outpouring, an outpouring to be so consumed with Jesus. Amen. And his will be done. His will, his will done. is for souls to bring himself glory. You know, to be poured out on all flesh. So, Father, today I pray, Lord, you would ignite a burning, burning desire yes, in our Lord hearts Jesus. to fear you, to yes, love Lord. you, to know you, to acknowledge, Lord, that we are nothing and you are everything, are all in all. And all things were created by you, through you, for you. Lord, even our very soul and all our times and seasons are in your hand, Lord. We pray for a mighty move of your spirit in our lives. Refresh, yes, revive the zeal of God within us. Lord, the, those things in our life that so easily pull us into the world and have bondages on our hearts, Lord, on our eyes, on our mind, on our ears. Lord, loose those things off of us today. In Jesus' name, so our hearts are totally devoted to you. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> Lord God, the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the Let's pride of life. Name, oh Lord, God. Lord God, set the captives free. This is the fast you desire, Lord God. Hallelujah. Oh, I worship you, Lord. Move, Lord, through this ministry and this channel. May everyone, Lord, on this channel, may we de be devoted to serving you in spirit and in oh, truth, yes, Lord, Lord yes. and be devoted to the the truth of your word, expose all lies and deceptions, Father God. Lord, any wolves in sheep's clothing, Lord, any Jezebel spirits and anything attached to that, Lord, envy, strife, pride, remove it, Lord, out of our midst. Help us to walk in the love of the Father and love for one another. Yes, Lord. Showing forth the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, help us to be steadfast in you. Seek in your face and in fasting and prayer, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, Jesus. We can't do it, Lord. We have nowhere to turn but you. Nowhere but you. And we don't want to go anywhere Lord, else. You have the words of life, Lord. In Jesus' name. I pray this today, Lord. Oh, God Almighty. God Almighty. Yes, Lord. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be having prayer again after after the teaching. Those that can join, I know sometimes Richard has some editing to do. He can't always be um, stay long in the prayers. But and if you have jobs and whatever you're doing, just um, just pray, pray. That's all we're asking is is that you'll join us in your hearts with, for prayer if you can't be in the Zoom. And you may not so, realize it, but if you have the Spirit of the Lord, and I know that you all do, you are all praying yeah, continually, subcon uh, yeah. uh, subconsciously. Yeah. You don't realize you're doing it, but the Spirit that's in you is the one that's mm. praying for you. Amen. So have a blessed day, and we will see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. God bless you all.